Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. Today we have a special throwback interview with Dr. William Davis, best-selling author of Wheat Belly. Dr. Davis's grain-busting manifesto sat atop the New York Times bestseller charts for what must truly feel like an alarming amount of time for the big food industry. But it sure makes me happy. You see, one of the hardest things for people, myself included, to accept when they first begin this lifestyle is that whole grains are not necessarily good for you. But Abel, everyone says that whole grains are healthy and so do the commercials. They're wrong. Okay, but wheat is in everything. I know, it's awful. But whole wheat is healthier than white flour. Not really. Actually, there's a germ of truth, sorry, in that last part. As Dr. Davis says, whole grains are indeed healthier than white flour products, just as filtered cigarettes are healthier than unfiltered cigarettes. Less bad does not mean healthy, despite the pleas of well-meaning nutritionists. To illustrate a few of the more remarkable and unexpected results of wheat elimination, what happened when Dr. Davis advised his patients to cut out wheat? Incredible weight loss, reduced blood sugar, relief from acid reflux, and the gas, cramping, and diarrhea of IBS, or irritable bowel syndrome, increased energy, more stable moods, and deeper sleep, relief from arthritis, dramatically improved cholesterol values, reduced blood pressure and inflammatory measures, and much more. In Wheat Belly, Dr. Bill Davis exposes the harmful effects of what is actually a product of genetic tinkering and agribusiness being sold to the American public as wheat. It's a terrific read, and I highly recommend you spend a few hours curled up with it. You'll never go back to your wily, weedy ways. Now, before we get to the show, let's talk about how to survive the holidays wheat-free. One of the questions I get most this time of year is, how can I enjoy great food during the holidays without completely blowing my hard-earned results? After years of holidays on a diet, I believe the trick to surviving temptation is actually giving into it with recipes that are grain-free, low in sugar, and nutrient-dense. There are just too many treats surrounding us this time of year to heed the naysayers' advice, don't eat sweets. So if you're going to eat cookies, cakes, pies, and worse, how about you make them guilt-free with real food ingredients? So if you want our best squeaky clean paleo recipes all in one place, I've got great news. We've slashed the price on our best-selling paleo e-cookbook, Fat Burning Chef. Check it out today to get over 200 delicious fat-burning, muscle-feeding recipes from the best cooks in paleo. You can get all the goodies at fatburningchef.com. We spent over a year gathering the best paleo, grain-free, real food recipes from the top chefs on the net, and it's finally ready for you. The Fat Burning Chef is an e-cookbook with over 200 quick and easy recipes that will help you lose fat, avoid disease, and experience superhuman energy. Blueberry cheesecake, smoked pork shoulder, drizzled in homemade barbecue sauce, and much more are waiting for you. You can make these quick and easy meals in 20 minutes or less. The recipes are gluten-free, paleo, 100% real food, and no counting needed. And thousands of people all across the world are enjoying the recipes right now. Laura says, just made Fat Burning Man's BLT salad, and I think I'm in love. Vicky says, the bacon-wrapped meatballs were delicious baked on a bed of cabbage. The whole family loved them. Elizabeth says, my four-year-old and I had fun making the zucchini meat boats with the sweet potato medallions. Very good. But it's not just about the recipes. We want to change the world with real food. So when you buy The Fat Burning Chef, you get a free copy to give as a gift to share with family or friends. Help us spread this message of health and share it with the people you care about completely for free. And when you get Fat Burning Chef soon, you'll even get our Wild Holiday Feasts e-cookbook completely for free. All you have to do to get your discount and bonuses is go to fatburningchef.com. One last time, just type it in. It's fatburningchef.com and you can even get our Wild Feast ebook for free. All right, on to the show. Interviewing Dr. Bill Davis was great fun and he has a superb Casey Kasem-esque voice. Just listen. In the show, we talk about how wheat is a Trojan horse for your gut that destroys your intestinal tract, how eating a Snickers bar is less unhealthy than two slices of whole wheat bread, why the worst part of a hamburger is the bun, how a diet high in grains, not fat, causes heart disease, and much more. 
All right, let's go hang out with Dr. Davis. All right, we're here with Dr. William Davis, author of the New York Times bestseller, Wheat Belly. How's it going, Dr. Davis? Fabulous, Abel. Thank you. Excellent. I, just before we start, I've been listening to a few of your podcasts and, and different interviews, and I think you have a terrific radio voice. <laughs> so that's one reason I'm excited to have <laughs> you on the show. It's not a singing voice, I can assure you. Oh, is that right? <laughs> But yeah, I, I just want to say to everyone out there, if you haven't already checked out Wheat Belly, it's causing quite a hubbub. I was just uh, talking with Dr. Davis about this. Um, been at the top of the charts as a New York Times bestseller for a long time, and it's just a fantastic read. Uh, it's entertaining, clear, and fun, and those are not really common traits for a diet book. So <laughs> how did you uh, get into this, Doc, and, and why did you decide to write a book in the first place? Well, you know, Abel, this is what I see. You know, I, I practice, of course. I practice preventive cardiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there is no shortage, sadly, of heart disease, of course. And there's no shortage of overweight people and certainly no shortage of people with diabetes and prediabetes. Yeah. Well, if, if, if your interest is to not have a heart attack or have a bypass operation or three stents, part of that equation has to be you can't be diabetic or you mm -hmm. can't even be prediabetic. And so the people who'd come to me who were interested in stopping their disease or reversing it, uh, one of the things, one of the necessary steps is to not be diabetic or pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted better tools to do that. You can't do it with drugs. All the drugs do is cover it up. They, they cover up some of the phenomena. They don't really get rid of the underlying process. Right. So I wanted a way to help people reduce blood sugars. That's it. So uh, there's a very simple fact often glossed over in nutrition discussions, and you know this, and much of the paleo community knows this, but mm -hmm. the broad uh, public does not. Yeah. And that is the glycemic, glycemic index of two slices of whole wheat bread is higher than table sugar. Yeah, it's so wild. So, yeah, it's in every table of glycemic index. It's been there since 1980s when the first – study on glycemic index was created. Mm -hmm. So using that very simple, very simplistic observation, I asked people, uh, I told them, let's try removing wheat, see what happens. And they did it. And uh, their fasting blood sugars would go down, uh, as did the longer term measure of blood sugar, that measure called hemoglobin A1C. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I also saw, though, uh, small LDL particles, the most common cause for heart attack, death from heart disease, getting three cents, et cetera, is excesses of the small LDL particle. That dropped to the floor. And then people start telling me even more stories, like uh, I lost 30 pounds in three months, yeah. or my dandruff is gone, my sleep is deep, or my acid reflux, I've been taking Prilosec, Protonics, and uh, Asafax, and Pepsid, and all those drugs. For 10 years, it disappeared. I stopped my drugs. It didn't come back. My leg swelling went away. My rash. In other words, I started hearing all these incredible stories. And after I saw you know, the first few hundred times, Abel, you know, <laughs> I, it started to hit me upside the head. What, what the heck is going on? Yeah, are all these people crazy? <laughs> well, first I thought it was pure coincidence. Yeah. But, you know, what was happening to me every day, many times a day, Yeah. you know, that really got me thinking. And I started to do this in everybody. Uh, and that's when I saw this taken to a larger scale. And now that I've taken this to many thousands of people, both in the office, uh, online uh, experiences, the book, of course, and, and you see uh, not improvement in health, Abel, but life transformation. Yeah. I don't think it's a stretch to say that when people are off five drugs, are no longer diabetic feel better than they have in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I really just kind of stumbled on this. It's pretty amazing stuff. And then you personally, um, you write, I think I read it on your blog, that you were once an enthusiastic consumer of healthy whole <laughs> grains, right? So tell us about your personal experience of the journey sure. of eliminating grains. Yeah, at, at the risk of great personal embarrassment. <laughs> um, this is 20-some years ago. I was actually in Atlanta, and I was attending the American College of Cardiology meetings. Mm -hmm. And this was a time, Mabel, when all I, I was I was young, and I, all I wanted to do was this fancy. This was the Wild West age of heart procedures. Yeah. And angioplasty uh, was just getting underway. We were carving out and, and 
drilling out plaque. This is all even before stents. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, I, I was down in the meetings in Atlanta, and I saw an announcement for Dr. Dean Ornish, who's going to talk about his lifestyle heart program and how he reverses heart disease. So I thought, that's kind of neat. I really had no interest in prevention, to be honest. But I thought, that's kind of an interesting idea. I'm going to listen. So I, I sat in the, near the front row to hear Dr. Ornish talk, and he gave us his, spe his, his, his talk about how he claims that if you slash all animal products and vegetable oils and other oils from your diet and eat only grains, fruits, and vegetables, you will reverse heart disease. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, it's kind of a neat idea, knowing nothing about nutrition except what I learned in medical school, of course, which could be fit, fit on, a, on the back of a thimble. Yep. Uh, I, I gave it a try. I was on faculty at a university in Cleveland at the time, and I was jogging three to five miles a day along the Chagrin River, mm -hmm. and I promptly became diabetic. Wow. It's fast, fasting blood sugar is about 161. Uh, I had a mess of a, a metabolic pattern. My triglycerides went to 350, My and gosh. HDL went to 27. Well, you know, it didn't dawn on me all of a sudden. I had to kind of piece my way back because it didn't make sense to me. Uh, uh, but it became clear over time the problem was the diet, of course, mm -hmm. the grains in particular. You cannot live without oils. You cannot live on a grain-based diet. It is a perversion of human physiology, as you know. So <laughs> I like that uh, quote right there. That's a soundbite. <laughs> well, thankfully, I'm no longer diabetic. Yeah. I have a fasting glucose of 84 and a hemoglobin A1C of 4.8%. Wow. Uh, I'm not as fit as many of your listeners. Um, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s, but... Um, uh, I'm not diabetic, not even pre-diabetic, and I do nothing in the way of drugs. This is just mm -hmm. with diet and vitamin D helps and fish oil helps a little bit uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, but doing none of the darn drugs that are booming, as you know. You know, we, we're at the tail end of a recession, but the diabetes drug industry, Abel, has been enjoying double-digit growth all through the recession. Mm. So... <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, so that that's how I learned my lesson personally. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're on the right track now and helping spread the word. Now, you refer to the recommendation of cutting fat and eating more uh, healthy whole grains, and I'm doing air quotes right now, <laughs> as the largest dietary blunder ever made on an international scale. <laughs> so can can you explain why that's the case? Well, you know, this all starts, of course, back in the 60s when there was a tremendous push by the U.S. government, other governments, universities, foundations, because of the there was there was great fear that we would have a population explosion and we would literally have billions of people by the turn of the century starving. Mm -hmm. So there was great investment in uh, agricultural genetics and genetics research to generate high yield crops. Um, so there was great focus on corn, soy, and wheat in particular. Well, wheat was the specific recipient of a lot of genetics research, and it was also a great success from the standpoint of yield, and that is yeah. the generation of the high-yield semi-dwarf strain of wheat, this thing that stands about two feet tall, unlike everyone else's traditional notion of, of wheat, which is a four-and-a-half, five-foot tall, mm -hmm. uh, long, slender uh, amber waves of grain and all that. Right. But the semi-dwarf, high-yield strain that stands two feet high was the brainchild then of this genetics uh, research. It was so incredibly productive that once farmers saw the tenfold increase in yield per acre, they rapidly embraced it. So it was introduced into the U.S. in the late 70s. So it was actually introduced into the third world before the U.S. because they were starving, of course, mm -hmm. and it turned famine into surplus within a year of its introduction. So this was hailed as a great success. Uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, one of the principal developers, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, made the cover of Life magazine and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, because of the incredible increase in yield, it was rapidly embraced in India and China, Ethiopia, uh, and then in the wheat producing states in the U.S. as well as Canada. And so... Uh, it was slowly embraced. I'm sorry. It was embraced, uh, uh, introduced in the late 70s, rapidly embraced, such that by 1985, everything you and I bought at the grocery store came from the two-foot-tall 
dwarf strain. So we wow. have, in effect, exported uh, the semi-dwarf strain of wheat invented by American geneticists uh, uh, to virtually all other countries of the world. So it's you can find the older strains of wheat that our moms had or that were present in the, in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But for all practical purposes, all wheat sold today, whether it's here, Canada, the UK, Australia, Asia, comes from the two-foot-tall brainchild of genetics research. Yeah. And you mentioned a very important uh, point in your book that this mutant dwarf wheat hasn't really been made this way to be healthier for us. It's just to increase yield. A, a, a crucial, crucial point, Abel. That's right. This is a fundamental thinking flaw, mm -hmm. and, and not just for wheat, actually. It's, it's for many things. Yeah. It is the disengagement. It's the disconnect of agricultural research and humans. That is, they generate these things to suit their own agenda. Yeah. It usually increased yield. It might be, in other instances, tolerance to drought if, right. a plant, if a crop is going to be introduced into a, a drier region or maybe tolerance to cold for more northern uh, extreme climates. It could be any number of other things, tolerance to mold or whatever, resistance to mold. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, increased yield. So, uh, but they, the problem is the techniques now used and the u techniques used in the 70s to generate this semi-dwarf high-yield wheat were sometimes quite bizarre hmm. and extreme. We're not talking about Farmer Jones uh, hybridizing yellow apples and, and red apples. We're <laughs> yeah. talking about some very, very bizarre and extreme techniques to induce mutations right. or to weave in uh, unique genetic sequences into um, the genes of, a, of a, another plant. Well, right. never, never able is the question asked, well, gee, uh, we did some pretty extreme stuff to this wheat or corn or soy or beets or potatoes. Mm -hmm. Is it does it remain suitable for human consumption? Yeah. So that and I like question, how you put it that way too. Remain suitable for human consumption. <laughs> well, you know, Abel, I, I would liken this to imagine the FDA tomorrow said, uh, you know, we decided that there's really no need for drug companies to make an FDA application for drugs. Mm -hmm. We're going to let the market make that decision. Yeah. So the drug companies could release their drugs and see how it plays out in the market with no pre-clinical uh, testing, uh, and they just see if people survive and if it works and see how much money they make. <laughs> well, that, that, of course, would be absurd. It would be dangerous. It would be absolute pandemonium. Mm -hmm. But that is what the agriculture industry has been doing right. for over 40 years. And it's it's not one of these things where it's siloed exposure. Wheat seems to be in everything these days. Oh, a very, very critical observation. That's right, Abel. And, you know, it, that, that raises a very, very disturbing question in my mind. I'm, I don't believe I'm a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I got to believe there's it's not an accident that in 1960, you and I could walk up and down the grocery store aisles and ask, where is wheat? And we'd find it in rolls and, and bread and pancake mix. Mm -hmm. But in 2012, if you and I walk up and down the aisles of any standard grocery store, we find wheat in rolls, bread and pancake mix, of course. But we mm -hmm. also find it in Twizzlers and granola <laughs> bars yeah. and uh, Campbell's tomato soup and instant soup and taco seasoning and frozen dinners. In other words, it's in almost everything. Now, why? When I make tomato soup, I don't say to myself, I think this really needs some wheat flour. <laughs> so, yeah, I got to believe, Abel, it's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have proof. I had something close to proof, but I, it's, it's proven elusive. But I'd like to have the proof that this has been known by the food industry, the big food. And I don't mean mom and pop. I mean, big food, big mm -hmm. agriculture, big food, mm -hmm. smart scientists, well-paid, smart people who noticed in their food trials that something was stimulating people's appetite like crazy. It's good and for business. They, and it's good. It's exactly, it's good for business. And by the way, when uh, this is, this is I, I'm being guilty of correlation is not causation. Sure. But if we backtracked and uh, tallied up calorie consumption in, in the 1980s, we noticed that exactly the moment when semi dwarf wheat was introduced, we saw calorie consumption increased on average 
440 calories per person per day, every wow. day, 365 days per year. That's exceptional. And now you talked about this a little bit earlier, but so wheat isn't genetically modified like corn or soy, right? And you talk about in your book how it might be even worse. So can you explain how wheat has been manipulated by man? In the language of geneticists, wheat has not been genetically modified, meaning the techniques of genetic engineering, gene splicing, etc., were not used to generate this two-foot-tall semi-dwarf strain of wheat. They are absolutely right. The techniques used to generate semi-dwarf wheat were far less predictable, much cruder, and far worse than genetic modification. <laughs> That's saying That's a lot. That's what tells you, mm -hmm. right? That the techniques used were far worse and unpredictable. You cannot control, for instance, what mutations you induce with gamma ray radiation yeah. of the seeds or embryos or high dose X-ray or what's called chemical mutagenesis. If uh, that is exposing seeds and embryos to toxic chemicals to induce mutations. Yum. So <laughs> these are the techniques used to generate modern wheat. So uh, I, I'm no defender of uh, genetic modification. That's a whole new uh, other set of problems. But genetic modification is an improvement mm -hmm. over the techniques that were used prior to the 1980s uh, yeah. and an improvement over the techniques used to generate modern semi-dwarf wheat. So it's <laughs> it's almost a, a more elegant solution. And I'm no fan of GMOs at all, but it, it does seem like it's more kind of streamlined than some of these very bizarre tactics they <laughs> used on wheat. Yes, uh, genetic, that, that's right. You and I are no defenders of genetic modification, but we want to focus our criticism where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And if we say uh, genetic modification is bad, but all other techniques are okay, which is, by the way, what the USDA says, mm. uh, in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, we're going to find out we still have a mess on our hands because we have literally thousands of products on the market that have, have been the recipient of other techniques. So we got to look at those, too. And unfortunately, this goes back many years. So we have lots and lots of foods that have been changed. Though I think we've got to pick our battles, right, in nutrition yeah. and health. Mm -hmm. And some battles really don't need to be fought. They're just not that important. Mm -hmm. I pick on the wheat battle because it's, uh, one, it's the worst thing in your diet by a long stretch. Mm -hmm. Two, this incredibly silly situation where we have our own government agencies telling us, cut your fat and be sure to eat more healthy whole grains, of yeah. course. Oops. So a lot of the uh, paleo folks especially know uh, about the evils of gluten and lectins in wheat, but there are some other issues with wheat as well. So which are those? I'm glad you raised, raised that issue because uh, a lot of people say, I don't have gluten sensitivity. This is not important to me. Mm -hmm. So you and I know this is not, this is not about uh, elimination of gluten for gluten sensitive people. This is a, a conversation suited for the broad public because it's not about just gluten. It's about gliadin, for instance, the opiate, the opiate in wheat that stimulates appetite and has odd mental and emotional effects, mm -hmm. such as um, poor behavior, behavioral outbursts, and difficulty with attention in children with ADHD and autism. Uh, it's responsible for tr triggering the manic phase of bipolar illness and hearing voices, auditory hallucinations, in people with paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, as well as appetite stimulation in us non-schizophrenics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the lectins, as you point out, the wheat germ gluten and wheat. Lectins in plants are meant to be toxic to insects and molds, and they can be toxic to consuming mammals like humans. Thankfully, most lectins in plants, like spinach, say, are benign, and nothing happens when we eat them. But not all lectins are benign. Mm -hmm. Ricin, for instance, of course, is a lectin. That's used as a, as a neurotoxin, right. as in the uh, subway attack in, in Tokyo. And we all the spy movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we wheat germ gluten is a lectin, and it is not a benign lectin. It is indigestible in human intestinal tract, and it has the peculiar capacity to unlock, in the human intestine, to unlock the normal barriers to foreign substances. So ingestion of wheat most concentrated, by the way, in wheat germ, mm -hmm. uh, allows open entry of foreign, undesirable substances into your bloodstream. This is probably why people who consume wheat, thereby wheat germ gluten, have more 
rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. and lupus mm -hmm. and polymyalgia rheumatica and polymyositis and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In other words, all the, the long, many page long list of inflammatory diseases because wheat is a Trojan horse for foreign substances to gain access into your bloodstream. Uh, you can also uh, measure antibodies against wheat germagglutinin because it does cross that barrier into your bloodstream, which is very, very destructive, by the way. Mm -hmm. it, if I feed wheat germagglutinin, incidentally, to an, a laboratory animal in modest quantities, it destroys its intestinal tract. Jeez. And then there's the amylopectin A. That's the unique carbohydrate in wheat that explains why two slices of whole wheat bread raised blood sugar higher than six teaspoons of table sugar. Mm -hmm. It is a uniquely digestible uh, complex carbohydrate. That, that's, of course, what the nutritionists tell us. It's complex. It must be good. What they didn't tell you is the complex structure of amylopectin A means it's even more digestible than table sugar sucrose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just part of the list. Abel, there's, there's even more, but those are the biggies. Those are the big problems with wheat. So it's not just about gluten. It's about so many more things. Uh, and so, but we don't want to say this is a conversation suited for the gluten sensitive mm -hmm. and they should eliminate gluten. This is a conversation suited to all human beings. Because right. this stuff has no business in the human diet. Yeah, but at least there is a growing awareness about gluten. And to that uh, to that point, so why is celiac disease expanding so quickly? I believe it's the enrichment of the G, uh, what's called the GLIA alpha nine sequence. It's mm -hmm. a it's a gene sequence virtually absent in the wheat of 1950 that is highly enriched in modern wheat. Uh, and now we have this situation where we have a, essentially a quadrupling, a 400% increase uh, in the incidence of celiac disease since uh, 1960. So it's a change. Something changed. Now, oddly, the gastroenterologists have known about this because of these data. And mm -hmm. they've asked, well, why? They've asked such things as maybe there's a virus. Maybe more mothers are breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think... It's less likely humans have changed because humans really haven't changed all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe we have iPods now, but we haven't changed <laughs> funnily that much. But I think the wheat has been changed dramatically. And now the data are emerging. The studies are emerging that tell us, oh, yeah, this stuff is very different. And the sequences, the genetic sequences and proteins have been identified that are causal for celiac disease. And they are enriched mm -hmm. in modern wheat. So it's time to retire the expression, the greatest thing since sliced bread, I suppose. Oh, 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 yes, that's right. <laughs> now, uh, so why is whole wheat, though, um, and, and other grains for that matter, assumed to be God's gift to man? Everyone <laughs> raves about them. Yeah, you know, there's. I, I think there's a, a list of reasons, but I think one fundamental, one basic reason is this, you know, very few sciences are guilty of such fuzzy thinking as nutrition. <laughs> And, and one of the flawed sequences of logic that you'll find over and over again in nutrition is, is this. If you take something bad in diet and you replace it with something less bad, yeah. and there's an apparent health benefit, a whole bunch of the less bad thing must be good for you. <laughs> so I draw this parallel. What if I told you just unfiltered Tarryton cigarettes are bad for you? But filtered Salem cigarettes are less bad for you. By the logic of nutrition, you and I should smoke a lot of Salem cigarettes. Right. That, of course, is, is absurd. <laughs> but that is the logic used by, in, in virtually all studies, uh, the epidemiologic studies that prove uh, that whole grains are better. Because whole grains uh, generate less cancer, less heart disease, less hypertension and less diabetes as compared to white processed flour products. Mm -hmm. So the unavoidable conclusion in the, in the logic of nutritionists is you must have more healthy whole grains. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the next se sequence in that logic should be, well, what's the effect of no healthy whole grains? That's where the magic starts. That's where you start <laughs> yeah. to see all these incredible effects I, I call this able the two plus two equals 11 effect hmm. that applies to wheat. And that is, you know, we know about lectins. We, we know they're bad. We know that gliadin has mind effects. We know that amylopectin A has exaggerated, outsized 
blood sugar effects. Mm -hmm. and, but you know, each one of those things res is responsible for some of the adverse effects of wheat. But you put it all together, the 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 sum is bigger than the the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. In other words, yeah. you get this incredible large effect, bigger than you thought. And so I don't see, you know, if this were just about losing 20 pounds, well, that's kind of interesting, but that's about the end of the story. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's about turnarounds in health like I've never seen before. Yeah. It's about people who I've brought back from the brink of colon removal surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about people who've been incapacitated, who are incapable of exercise, even doing simple things like walking across a room who now jog. It's, <laughs> it's about people who had ter had uh, were taking insulin and three drugs for diabetes mm -hmm. who now take nothing and have better numbers than they had on insulin and three drugs. That's great. So I I've never seen anything like this. I, I, I love nutrition. I love nutritional supplement. I love health. But Abel, I've never seen anything even come close to the power of removing this incredible poison, this poison <laughs> from our diet. Yeah, I know personally when I uh, a few years ago decided to go uh, a grain free and especially just I, I kind of first went wheat free and all of these bizarre, wonderful things happened, like all of these, these issues that I thought I just had disappeared things like dandruff a puffy face that was getting puffier and like my pale skin and just like a little bit of pudginess that had no real reason for being there despite all my exercising and things like that it just magically seemed to disappear not right away but uh, within a few weeks it's all of a sudden all of those things just kind of disappeared it seems Isn't like that's that a very great? common thing it's very common but you know it raises the question why why would a young healthy fit guy have all those changes, you know, the skin is a large, large organ. Mm. And it, and things t tend not to happen to the skin in isolation. In other words, if there's something funny going on in the skin, it's probably going on elsewhere, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's going on in the gastrointestinal tract and liver and maybe the airways of the lungs and sinuses and maybe the brain. So it, just those surface changes, to me, even though they might just be skin changes mm -hmm. tell me there's probably a whole lot more going on is that lectin is that the wheat germ gluten causing the entry of foreign substances and causing inflammation yeah is it the peculiar water retaining effect of wheat mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly how each and every one of these effects is caused because a lot of it hasn't yet been yet explored mm -hmm. but it's very consistent to have your experience that is you remove wheat puffiness in the face goes away puffiness in the legs uh, there's a great deal of water loss. I've got people who I met in heart failure, able heart wow. failure, which is Jeez. a very bad condition, <laughs> yeah. who came out of it, came out of it uh, with elimination of wheat. Not to say all heart failure, of course, is caused by wheat. Sure. But I like I like elimination of wheat a lot better than taking nasty diuretics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And a lot of people who start following the uh, the diet that I advocate, my clients will say, um, I don't get cold sores anymore, or there are no more kidney stones and other things that, you know, they may have been taking drugs for just also kind of disappear. And you've been with hundreds and hundreds of your own patients who have been cured from some pretty dramatic things. So what are some of the examples of that? You, you talked about a few, but I'm sure you have more. Yeah. You know, the uh, uh, let me let me tell your listeners about the the case that really I, I finally put my foot down when I when this happened to me um, because it was such a dramatic case and it proved to me it was it was not the first case, of course. It was one among many. But to me, I, I, it made me say, all right, that's it. I've got to write this book and tell this story more broadly. Uh, we need more information, but this is such a powerful um, observation. It has to be told to a broader audience. And that was the 38-year-old school teacher who I had met because she had uh, palpitations. That is this sensation of an irregular heartbeat. It turned mm -hmm. out to be nothing. But nonetheless, she told me her story that she had also colitis for 12 years and was incapacitated by pain as well as diarrhea and hemorrhage. So she had it so badly, she would have bloody stools mm -hmm. and she'd have to go in about every three months for a transfusion. That's how bad it was. So she's on three drugs, including a very expensive intravenous drug. Uh, she's got two little kids teach, I believe it was fourth or fifth grade. Uh, well, she comes in one day and tells me they 
scheduled her for a colon removal surgery, and they're going to give her an ileostomy bag, like, like a colostomy bag. Mm -hmm. So a young woman with a bag that affixed to her skin that catches the stool on the surface. Uh, she's a school teacher, age 38. And I just, oh, man. So I told her, you know, you've got it. You've got to try eliminating the wheat. I mm -hmm. see people with multiple gastrointestinal problems get better. She says, well, they, they already biopsied me twice. I don't have celiac disease. They ran the blood test. I don't have celiac disease. And I said, I, I know you don't have celiac disease, but you are consuming wheat. Mm -hmm. You've got nothing to lose. They're going to take your colon out. So she kind of sighs and decides to give it a try. What the heck? She comes back uh, about three months later. Uh, no ileostomy bag, by the way. <laughs> she told me that within three days, all the cramps and diarrhea had subsided, had stopped. Uh, five days, bleeding had stopped. Uh, she stopped one drug. Uh, some months passed. Everything has stopped. Off another. Anyway, two years passed. Uh, she is cured, Abel. She's <sighs> not better. She's cured. She's on none of the drugs. She lost 38 pounds, too, by the way. <laughs> um, she... Uh, uh, has no cramps, no diarrhea, normal bowel movements. Um, uh, of course, they canceled her surgery. She didn't get better. She was cured. That's and when amazing. I started seeing things like that, and that's just one very dramatic, but w one among many cases, mm -hmm. I realized this is not just about losing 10 pounds. Yeah. yeah. This is about a, a, a head-to-toe head -to destruction of health. That it, So it, it raises a concerning thing, a concerning question, that is, how much of what we do in healthcare? I'm in healthcare. Mm -hmm. How much of what we do in treating hypertension, high cholesterol, fluid retention, heart failure, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, migraine headaches, are we just treating diet, but more specifically treating the perverse products of agribusiness? Mm. And I think we are. I think we're treating to a large degree. We are treating the unintended side effects of consuming crops and foods that have been changed with no questions asked about its suitability for human consumption. Yeah. yeah. So the 99 cent menu isn't actually that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well said. That's right. <laughs> And then, it, you know, one thing that's interesting to me is that a lot of people are just like a hamburger. That's a junk food. But the worst part is the bun, <laughs> not the burger. Yeah, that and the pink slime. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Now, lots of people have made a convincing case, and there's a lot of research uh, that points to this fact that switching to a grain based diet or, or starting to incorporate a large amount of grains caused humans to become shorter, fatter and sicker thousands of years ago. Uh, so can you comment on that a little bit? What, what happened when we started relying on grains? Yeah, great point. Because, uh, you know, this question is coming up a lot now. I'm very grateful mm -hmm. that, well, gee, if the problems really started in the 1960s and 70s when the geneticists fiddled with wheat, what if we go back to the wheat of 1950 or even the 19th century or even the Bible? Well, I remind everybody that, yeah, that's true. If, if we go back in time and we go to the wheat of 1950 or the 19th century, like the red fife strain grown throughout Canada and U.S. back then, mm -hmm. or the emmer wheat of the Bible, the 28 chromosome form of wheat, our current wheat's 42 chromosomes, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, or we go back to the original ancestor of wheat, which is einkorn, uh, a 14 chromosome plant, each step of the way, wheat becomes increasingly more benign. But does it ever become entirely safe? Mm -hmm. I don't think it does. And mm -hmm. so you make the point, perfect point, that when hunter-gatherer humans, humans who would hunt down animals, antelope, ibex, spear fish, wild boar, and gather wild garlic and figs and dates, and um, uh, leaves and berries and grubs and insects, when they finally saw this, these plants growing uh, in the field and gathered them and realized they could crush the seed head down to uh, porridge or later on flour, mm -hmm. there was a downturn in health. So humans lost height, developed bone diseases, dental cavities, uh, and had other uh, in the archaeological archaeological record there are, is a record of a deterioration in health that coincides perfectly with the uh, adoption of wheat into the human diet. So I think that we could argue that wheat, but specifically uh, I'm sorry grains, but specifically wheat 
are not entirely benign. They may be more benign than what we have today, but they're never quite entirely benign. I'm yeah. getting these calls from farmers who say, we understand what you're saying. We don't want to, you know, a lot of farmers are very nice people. Mm -hmm. And they say, we don't want to contribute to killing people. What do you think we should do? Should we bring back red fife from the 19th century? Should mm -hmm. we bring back einkorn? First of all, I'm, I'm gratified they're even thinking about it because <laughs> what they're- That's wonderful. Yeah, what they're asking, of course, is can we eke out a living uh, generating a tenth the output we used to? Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly if you go organic, they're going to have to learn new techniques, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm very gratified to even thinking about it. But uh, I, I would just as soon not do that because I, I don't think it's a good idea to generate some of those older forms of wheat. There will be a market, I believe, Abel. I think there's going to be people who say, you know what? I think it's okay to have einkorn mm -hmm. or kamut or spelt or some other form of ancient wheat. And I think that's great. I think it's, they're better off. Yeah. yeah than eating the nonsense that we're sold today. <laughs> but I think if you and I said, well, we don't want to just be better in health. We want to have our best go at ideal health. Mm -hmm. Then I wouldn't eat anything that comes from the family of wheat plants at all, ancient or no. Right. And this is an interesting point because I think a lot of people, especially if they've never tried it, get the wrong idea about uh, paleo or like the caveman diet or low carb for that matter. And they think that... Um, <laughs> eating lots of meat makes you strong or something like that, right? But what if <laughs> what if all the health benefits are from what you're not eating, right? right. Like all of a sudden yeah. your body isn't beaten down anymore by wheat and these other grains that are doing just horrible things to your gut and your immune system and other sorts of things. When you remove them, your body can actually heal itself and, and gather these nutrients from the vegetables and the meats that you are eating. Cr crucial point. I, I think you hit a very crucial point right on the head. So uh, a lot of my friends are like you in the paleo community, in the CrossFit community, in the low carb community, uh, people who do things like uh, South Beach and, and similar diets. Mm -hmm. But we all share this similar observation that grains stink. <laughs> they don't belong in a human diet. They, they just do. And, and of course, made worse by the shenanigans of geneticists. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could label it what we want uh, in, in any of those categories, but I think we all pretty much have come to the same agreement. There's something wrong. You know, I think the low fat people are st just starting to get the message. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, because a lot of them are starting to, in a very nice way, say, uh, you know, you should eat more green vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really start to push that. But I think are kind of quietly saying, you know, those grains may not be as good as we thought they were. So I think a lot of us, we're all coming to similar conclusions from a variety of different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that to me is, you know, of course, the only ones who are not are the official sources of nutritional advice. <laughs> right. So I don't believe in your life, and certainly not in my lifetime, and I don't believe in yours, that we'll ever have a USDA, for instance, or a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services who will come out and say, you know all that stuff we told you? <laughs> Sorry. Not only was it wrong. <laughs> But we actually caused this the world's worst epidemic of obesity, diabetes ever seen in the history of mankind on Earth. Mm -hmm. So we take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> and so what about the people who, who, I guess, responsibly consume grains by soaking and, and fermenting them? What would you say to those folks? Well, I, I think I'd go right back and say it's, it's like putting that filter on your cigarette, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be a hair better. So if we sourdough ferment it or if we soak the seeds and let it sprout and thereby reduce the amylopectin A content by a few percent, we still have the same fundamentally flawed thing. That is this thing filled with wheat germ gluten and the gliadin protein. So you cannot change this thing mm -hmm. uh, enough to make it safe. If you take out all the badness in wheat, you'll have nothing left. <laughs> you'll have some fiber. <laughs> uh, because, there, you know, Abel, I don't believe this was a conspiracy to screw us over. Sure. I don't think there's... But I, you know, if, if there were two evil scientists somewhere who sat down and said, you know, let's make the worst possible thing for humans to consume that will destroy health, make them fat and diabetic, give them cataracts, arthritis, destroy their bowel health, give them acne and dandruff, mm -hmm. it would be wheat. Yeah. yeah. And it's it so is a perfectly crafted poison. 
It's funny because uh, so many, well, it's tragic actually that so many people, the average American uh, say, you put in front of them the two slices of whole wheat bread or a Snickers bar. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's less bad to go after the Snickers bar. That's right. <laughs> Both are bad, of course. We should qualify, right. Them, right? So you and I are not advocating Snickers bars, but uh, but so that's right. The national advice to eat more healthy whole grains. They might as well say go out eat more candy bars, mm -hmm. and it would so be bizarre. better. Yeah. Now I have a few questions for you as a cardiologist. Uh, I, I have. A bunch of listeners who've asked about heart disease specifically, uh, especially in the context of a high fat diet, uh, and they have lots of warnings coming from all directions. What do you say to those folks um, who do choose to go, say, low carb or, or controlled carb and have to eat more fat? Well, grains cause heart disease. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's becoming clearer and clearer. And saturated fat has nothing to do with heart disease. That's also becoming clearer and clearer. You know, if you use a flawed index, a, a surrogate index for heart disease risk, like total cholesterol, mm -hmm. you're going to come to flawed conclusions. You're going to come to conclusions like if you cut your saturated fat, you reduce total cholesterol. That must therefore be good for heart disease. Of course, they don't tell you that the reason why total cholesterol drops when you remove saturated fats because HDL drops. Mm -hmm. If you use LDL cholesterol, the more current and uh, modern version, if you look a little closely, you might see on your laboratory sheet, it says LDL cholesterol in parentheses calculated mm -hmm. or in fine print. In other words, that number wasn't even measured. So it was calculated from the Friedewald equation. That is this equation developed by regression, by the way, mm -hmm. in the 1960s by Dr. William Friedewald at the NIH. Well, he did that because he thought the fraction of cholesterol in the low-density lipoprotein fraction was a better reflection of heart disease risk, but it was not easy to measure back then mm -hmm. in backwaters like Milwaukee and Austin. So yeah. he came up with a way to calculate it. Well, it doesn't take much to put in a numbers in a calculator. The problem is the assumptions built into that equation are deeply flawed, and they're way off. It serves some purpose on a population basis. That is in a large number of people, say 10,000 people, but it is worthless. And it leads to false conclusions <laughs> because it is calculated. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a in, in effect, an invalid calculation because it leads you down. Here, so here's an irony. If I cut the grains in my diet and I measure, not calculate, measure mm -hmm. various LDL measures, by cutting grains, LDL drops to the floor. But if I use the calculated value, because of the flawed assumption used, it goes up. <laughs> How strange. Now, all the studies use calculated LDL, not measured LDL. And so we have all the studies for the statin drug industry and diet studies telling us, oh, if you do such and such, it reduces LDL cholesterol. They're reducing the calculated value. If you only use calculated, and these calculated values, by the way, Abel, go into the names of such things as uh, LDL particle number, mm -hmm. my preferred method on what's called an NMR test, or an apoprotein B. There are a number of these superior markers for the number of LDL particles, low mm -hmm. density like protein particles in your bloodstream. Uh, you'll find that cutting grains slashes. And even more importantly, if you go farther, not just count the number of LDL particles, but measure their size. Because Size makes a big difference here. Smaller particles, we measure them by size, but smaller is very different in conformation and behavior. It's right. also much more longer lasting. Small LDL particles are triggered by carbohydrates, mm -hmm. but specifically grains. Hmm. And you cut grains, you see the worst particle of all, small LDL particles, drop to the floor. Right. You don't see 10% drop. You don't see 15 You see 80 90, 100 percent drops in because that's what I do every day in practice because yeah. the small LDL particle, of course, is the number one cause for heart disease in the U.S. today because of the absurd advice to cut your fat, eat more healthy whole grains. When I meet people just starting out on their heart disease reversing adventure, they all have 
tons and tons of small LDL particles because they've all been following this nonsense to cut their fat, eat more healthy whole grains. You take the grains out, they lose weight, their blood sugar drops, their leg edema goes away, their dandruff disappears, their acne goes away, and small LDL drops to the floor. Wow. wow. So there's the answer, folks. <laughs> you said it much better than I could. Now, you mentioned statins. What do you, I get a lot of questions about that too, and obviously I'm not a medical doctor. What do you say to folks who are on statins or are considering them? Well, my view, Abel, is that treating this calculated LDL is malpractice. Mm -hmm. That is, it is such a flawed, absurd number. You cannot use this number to make any decisions. And so can, resigning somebody, this is what's done in practice, of course, resigning somebody to 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years of a statin drug at lots of cost and side effects for a fictitious number. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a fiction not too far uh, worse than uh, eat more healthy whole grains. And of course, those two go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah. Eating yeah. grains, right, gives you the appearance of a better cholesterol panel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the statin drug industry was, in in some regards, a response to the fiction of eat more healthy whole grains. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you measure these numbers, and you watch what really happens. If you take grains out of diet and you're otherwise healthy and don't do stupid things like eat jelly beans or cornstarch, um, you have a dramatic reduction in small LDL particles, measured LDL particles, and you'll find that the majority, not all, the majority of people never needed statin drugs in the first place. Mm -hmm. The statin drug market is many billions. Uh, I believe it's somewhere around $24 billion a year now. It's down from its high of $27 billion a year. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there's a need for those drugs in certain genetic disorders, but I don't think the need is even more than a billion dollars. It's a tiny fraction of the current market. There are conditions, I won't bore you and your listeners, but there are <laughs> conditions like uh, heterozygous hypercholesterolemia, familial combined hyperlipidemias. There are complex genetic patterns, ApoB variants, ApoC variants, et cetera, that uh, don't sadly do not respond fully to diet mm -hmm. and those people can have pretty serious problems but these are genetic defects this is not john q public who's got a high cholesterol this is people with very very substantial uh gene pro genetically determined problems and i think there's a l very limited role for statin drugs in those populations the problem is john q primary care or for that matter john q cardiologist makes no effort to distinguish who's got it on a genetic basis, mm -hmm. who's got it, just because they eat uh, fat or appear to have high cholesterol. Right. So uh, that's what. So these drugs are handed out indiscriminately, uh, and now, of course, we have this silliness about putting it in the water, and everyone yeah. should be on it regardless of their cholesterol value. <laughs> no, there are far more better way, far better ways, because that's what I do. I try to eliminate risk or reverse measures of coronary atherosclerosis, and Abel, you can do it. I have a long, long, long list of people who have stopped or even reversed coronary atherosclerosis without statin drugs. Some do require it with those mm -hmm. genetic disorders, but the, the majority nowadays do not need it, but it means following this kind of a diet. Yeah, that's great. So how do we drive this movement forward, uh, especially in the medical profession as a doctor, uh, who, who thinks like you do and, and especially has written this book, you're an enormous asset, but we need many more of you to kind of drive it mainstream and, and save us from all the bagels, so to speak. Well, I think it starts with talking to nice people like Abel James. <laughs> that is, you know, talking to people who have an audience who mm -hmm. understand what's going on. You know, you and I, Abel, no matter how hard we try, we'll never be able to go head to head with the Monsantos of the world, with the Merck and Pfizer's of the world. these And by the way, I should mention that one of the most vigorous supporters for the past 20 years of the healthy whole grain message as delivered by the wheat lobby and wheat trade groups has been the diabetes drug manufacturers. <laughs> so that's a kind of a smelly situation. Yeah, imagine think, that. Uh, but I think it starts with what you and I are doing because last I checked, I don't have eight to nine billion dollars in my marketing budget like monsanto <laughs> does to lobby the federal government that's their uh, annual spending mm -hmm. uh tally for uh, lobbying the federal government by the way and you don't Each. have legions of 
<laughs> of lawyers and assassins to send that's after right people. <laughs> we don't have we don't have those people out in the field looking for the for the uh, farmers who might have some glyphosate resistant corn in their field mm -hmm. uh, so we can't we can't compete with that in in their uh uh in their arena mm -hmm. we have to fight it in our own terms our own ground that's what you and i are doing right now uh and we write books and we talk about it online and we do blogs and social. I, so I liken this, Abel, this, I think the closest parallel is the Arab Spring. <laughs> it's the people who've been oppressed and given bad information while Muammar Gaddafi lives in his lavish castle <laughs> and drives 10 limousines. Yeah. So this is what's happened. We are, in effect, rallying social media and similar type tools to fight this oppressive uh, campaign of misinformation. Make no bones, people are making a lot of money from this message. I know one of the former uh, chairs of the U U.S. Department of Health and Human Services came into office, not very rich, left very wealthy. Mm. And this was also, by the way, uh, a man who uh, essentially pushed through legislation very favorable to companies like Monsanto. Mm -hmm. So we can all connect dots because <laughs> uh, lord so knows they need more money. money there's smart money out there <laughs> making so it, it, it strikes me you know probably smart money behind the fact that the uh, uh diabetes drug manufacturers have been funding the wheat lobby yeah now they, they were smart 20 years ago by the way wow so we're coming up on time but i, I have one more question for you and this is one that i, I think people will appreciate because I, I know I get this a lot in some of my clients. What's a quick, easy answer for someone, usually a nagging family member or friend who insists that whole grains are healthy? Well, you and I know, Abel, that some people just don't want the answer, mm -hmm. particularly because wheat is an opiate. So we're telling these, in effect, cocaine addicts that uh, <laughs> you got to stop it. So sometimes you just can't get through it. The best thing, I think, is to set the example. Yeah. If you do it and you lose weight and you feel fabulous and you lose all these health problems and you look like the absolute picture of health, after a while, it might be a few years, they'll mm -hmm. say, hey, Abel, what is it you're doing? Because I want to do it too. Yeah, that's that's great advice. All right, is there anything else that, that you want to say to everyone before we part ways? Well, I think you've probably got a receptive audience to start, Abel, but I, I remind everybody that uh, you and I are selling nothing. We're not selling drugs or procedures. Mm -hmm. We're just saying you can do this in the comfort of your own home. If you're skeptical, try it for four weeks. Eat no wheat. Doesn't even have to be low carb. Eat no wheat. Yeah. See what happens. More often than not, you'll have your answer. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Davis. This has been a great time. We'll definitely have to have you back on again soon. Oh, thank you. It would be my pleasure. Hey, this is Abel, and I have a quick question for you. Do you want to get in the best shape of your life without giving up your favorite foods? Don't miss your opportunity to get the new Fat Burning Chef e-cookbook featuring more than 200 delicious recipes from the top paleo chefs in the world. You can get it now for a huge discount at fatburningchef.com. You can type it in from any device. Keep on listening for the details. Meet Jane. Jane knows she's supposed to eat right, but it's been one heck of a long day and she's short on time to cook a healthy, delicious dinner. Jane knows she can get lean by choking down reheated chicken breast and steamed broccoli six times a day for the next three months, but that doesn't sound like very much fun. Fortunately, Jane's in luck because her friend just sent her a collection of over 150 quick and easy recipes that just so happen to keep the pounds off. It's called the Fat Burning Chef. And through the magic of the interwebs, this handy, interactive, digital cookbook beams straight to you instantly. And since it lives on your iPhone, iPad, Droid, computer, or other gizmo, you'll never be without quick and easy fat-burning meals. But it's not just about mouth-watering recipes. We want to change the world with real food. When you grab the Fat-Burning Chef, you get another copy as a free gift to share with your friends and family. So if you're short on time and want to know what's for dinner tonight, head on over to fatburningchef.com and we'll fix you right up. Bon appetit, Jane. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? 
please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or Fat Burning Man. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. This isn't a revolutionary new diet. This is something we've been doing for a while. Oh, for sure. I mean, you can even just look at human evolutionary history and what we're eating up. Not even up to 10,000 years ago. You know, the paleo approach tends to look at foods, or, you know, the standard definition of paleo.